With a land area of over 663,000 square miles, this gorgeous state, seated at the highest point on the map, attracts over 2 million visitors per year. But sadly, not all travelers make it back home. Do they go missing due to the country's harsh terrain and extreme weather? Or do they vanish because of something more sinister? This week's episode is The Alaska Triangle. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Well, uh, I, I, we always try to start off with thank yous if we have them. I want to thank everybody for coming to the Patreon Q&A. Yeah. We had so much fun, and we talked about fondue, and then I went and got fondue that very night. So thank you for making my night. Dreams Cheese come true on the Patreon Q&As. She's tastic. And we got to see your leg, your spider bite update. For those of you that have been wanting to see the scar, you missed out. This, this time you got to see the spider's bite scar. Last time you got to see Heather's Abe Lincoln tattoo. So it's, uh, what's next? We're just taking clothes off one layer at a time every Q and A. Strip poker. Uh, <laughs> it's very fun. We had a great time though. We did, and talked about serious stuff. We talked about careers and passions and things you want to do with your life, and it was just such a nice connection. And then in the Patreon Facebook group, there was such a nice thread of people. Uh, the person said, "I don't want to be too sappy," but then just people saying how much the show meant to them. So Aww. I just want to thank everyone for all that because I know it makes us both. We put a lot of time and effort, mm-hmm. and we want to give you something good and it's so nice to get that nice feedback so thank you it for all the, all the messages and dms we get i just really appreciate it. i've been gratitude journaling so i write you and my you're always in my gratitude Aww. journal paris is always in my gratitude journal and i always write uh folks that listen to the show because this is not a, anything without the folks that listen That's to the show true. it's just me and you on skype hanging out so <laughs> which, which is, is still fun, fun. it's yeah. a great time <laughs> we just hung out on skype for 30 minutes before we even we started did. recording we did so our uh, respective significant others always ask how long was that episode it wasn't that long <laughs> we we just talked minutes. to each other we were just in there for quite yeah. some time <laughs> we just are bullshitting back and forth so thank you guys yes That's all. thank I'm you i'm feeling sappy now we had we had a ton of fun we always get really great creative questions that <laughs> i'm always just like man the creative who thought, yeah who thought of who this? would have thought what three as seen on tv items would you like to take with you on a desert island that's great genius so good genius yeah we loved it we loved it so yeah so thanks and then now we get to and I, like we said that person on twitter said are you guys going to do something lighthearted after your three-part Kristen smart episode <laughs> yes we are we're yeah. going we're as going all out as this is. it's not as lighthearted as some of the ones we usually do after True. a deep dive but it's um you know when i first saw this advertised on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, oh, a show about mysteries. And by <laughs> the show I'm talking about is the travel channels, the Alaska Triangle. And I thought it's going to be about more like missing 411, people going mm-hmm. missing. And I was wrong, Heather. No, yeah, yeah. Paris told me after a while, you got to turn this off because about. 50, about 50% through the episode, it just takes a turn every time. And it's just like aliens, aliens, wormholes, cryptids. I have want to know who is who's doing the show lineup for a travel channel. That sh- that channel is not the travel channel anymore. No, it's, it's just places, places you don't want to travel to. It's conspiracy it's- theory channel. It's yes. it's bizarre. You look at the lineup and it's like. Ghost hunters, ghost adventures, ghost pros, monsters, yeah. monster aliens, monsters of the deep, monsters of the the sea, monsters of the space. There's a lot of monsters to be to be talked about. I don't I don't get it. I don't get why it's still called the Travel Channel. It doesn't make any sense. No, to me. when I was I'm telling you, when I was a kid, it was all about most a- adventurous roller coasters mm-hmm. in America. I would I was glued to that shit. I love. Or those. it was like. United States road trip, all of the best places to go in every state. I wanted to watch that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't watch some of these ghost shows. But the, I think that we have uh, ascertained that the narrator of the Alaska Triangle series is, he's very well, uh, he's doing well for he's himself. sought after. And, oh, yeah. He's a popular guy because he's similar to the Oak Island he, person. I think, where, the, I think it is the Oak Island I narrator. Think it is. We got we to gotta meet him. If you know the narrator of Mystery <laughs> of Oak Island in Alaska Triangle, give him our number. 
I want to hear him narrate we'll my life. We'll know the second he calls us. Yes. We're like, oh, gosh. Yeah, that I want voice. him to narrate my life. It's so dramatic, It's but in, in a very, like, calming way. I don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah, so the Alaska Triangle, while there is a ton of mystery that goes on there, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that go along with it, too. So we're kind of... We're kind of doing several angles to the yes. to the try angle, and we I, I for all I love about Paris, he doesn't know a ton about crime. You know, he's not like me where you can just list off. Oh, so that's a serial killer from there. And as we were watching things about Alaska, he said, "With all this terrain, I bet it would be really easy to be a serial killer." I was like, "Yeah, there's a bunch of them. there's famous ones," and mm-hmm. he's like, "Just that that wilderness, you could hunt people." I said, "That's what one of them did." So. We are not talking about Robert Hansen or any of the serial killers mm-hmm. today, which is another treacherous thing. Although I will say, this is what happens. This is why people go missing in Alaska. For hours I spent researching this. I was looking I was looking up some facts for that written intro. I was real proud of myself and my geography facts. But when you Googled it, all these photos of Alaska came up. And I said, I just, I'd really like to go there. Oh, same. So knowing same. what I know, yes. I still want to go. I have read and watched hours of people that go to into the wilderness of alaska and never return and still i'm like i'd like to go i'd like to see it for myself it's beautiful gorgeous maybe a cruise maybe we can do an alaskan cruise oh that's invited us along we we will (laughs) go to an alaskan cruise i want to the thing with cruises they're they can be fun but you just get you know a couple hours at a place i want to stay at one of these alaskan towns and go out on a boat and do stuff there. But then I want to go into like, I want to go on some hikes and stuff. But I don't know. At the same time, that's what hundreds of people a year also say they're going to do. And then they're never seen from again. Yeah, that's the problem. Is It's so beautiful. It invites you in. Or is it because the energy vortex is sucking you in? Could, could be. Could be. I went down an energy vortex YouTube rabbit hole and... You would, I don't think you'd be surprised to learn that there's a lot of odd ducks out there talking about uh, the quote science behind energy vortexes. I do, I will say, I do believe in the vortexes having visited Sedona, but the the folks on YouTube sure got a fa- funny way of presenting it. Yeah, uh, I am not surprised by that, <laughs> not in, not in the least. What I was surprised by is the number of people that go missing in Alaska per year it's it's incredible i was reading that so many rhode islands could fit inside of alaska but then the population of rhode island is bigger than alaska alaska's san Fran- the population of san francisco is bigger than alaska but it's, it's, fantastic it's, how that it's the biggest state in the united mm-hmm. states everyone in case you didn't know this mm-hmm. and over i think more than half of it is just untouched land beautiful keep it that way yes yes please preserve it at at all costs but i also started reading some articles that sometimes people move there because they want to go missing oh they want to get off the grid they want to just kind of you know it's kind of like the end of the earth for a lot of people because Mm. as big as the state is Mm -hmm. i think it's also the most i don't know how they phrased it but basically for every person that lives there, they have like a couple of miles to their to themselves. If you place them out all over the state, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, yeah, they live. I guess the towns are clustered, but if you needed to move far away, mm-hmm. I think yes. one of the tr- Alaska Triangle. I've watched so many videos. I think it was on Alaska Triangle. It could have been on YouTube though. A, a person had a cabin that caught fire, and nobody. There's just no one around. Yeah, no. so they just had to run out into the snow in the nighttime and try to throw snow on the fire and try to grab whatever possessions they could get. I guess the good thing is kind of the snow around it kept the fire from really spreading. Mm-hmm. But you just think you can't just call. I mean, you can call rescue to come in, but nobody's up the street. Yeah. So and it's a lot a of double edged sword. A lot of places it's very isolated and you're, you're there's not another person for miles. So but that's also why people can go missing and then never be found. It's true. It's true. So you know? Well, there's a lot of possible explanations. There are. There are. We're going to get into quite a bit of them. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Miles of sprawling forests, crystal clear alpine lakes rich with salmon, massive, pristine glaciers, and wildlife such as moose, caribou, wolves, and several kinds of bears. 
the beauty and majesty of the untouched Alaskan wilderness is undeniable. It can also be deadly. Every year, thousands of outdoor enthusiasts and tourists regularly choose the frontier state as their vacation destinations to partake in hiking, fishing, hunting, and skiing. Tragically, many are never seen or heard from again. According to the History Channel, as of 2020, 738,000 people live in Alaska, but over the past 20 years, more than 60,000 people had been reporting missing. The amount of people reporting missing in Alaska is over twice the national average, according to How Stuff Works. One area particularly known for its high number of missing persons report is known as the Alaska Triangle. Stretching from Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, in the south, to Juneau, the capital, to the small northern coast town of Utkiagvik, formerly known as Barrow. The area of land known as the Alaska Triangle has claimed the lives of more than 16,000 people since 1988. It's interesting how it all happens right there in the middle, and in the uh, it, it, it encompasses a, a bay area, too, of water. So mm-hmm. it's not just like, oh, well, it's the main part of the land. It's, it's a chunk of the land, but it's interesting how everything's centered around it in a triangular fashion. Hmm. Borrowing its name from the better-known Bermuda Triangle, the Alaska Triangle, also called the Devil's Triangle, has many similarities to its tropical counterpart. Airplanes, boats, hikers, tourists, and even locals have gone missing without a trace, seemingly vanishing into thin air. With unforgiving terrain, dangerous wildlife, and oftentimes deadly weather conditions, it may seem unsurprising that the elements have claimed so many lives. However, there are those that believe other forces may be at play, forces that are capable of leaving no trace of evidence or a person's existence behind. According to the Travel Channel, about 100 aircraft crash in Alaska every year. One of the most famous occurred on January 26, 1950, when a Douglas C-54 Skymaster, carrying 44 passengers and crew, was headed from Anchorage, Alaska, to Great Falls, Montana. As the plane flew through the triangle, it made contact with the towers via radio, stating that they were on course two hours into their flight. After that communication, the plane was never seen or heard from again. The resulting search was one of the biggest in U.S. and Canadian history, but no sign of the aircraft was ever found. No debris or other items that would give a clue as to what happened. It doesn't help the argument, but the DC, or yeah, the C-54, I wouldn't say it crashed a lot, but it did have maybe five or six high-profile crashes in Florida, Massachusetts, uh, you know, not just this one, but this is the only one that it's nothing is found of it. Nothing could be found. Yes. Yeah. Little planes. Oh, man. I don't do little planes. I'm well, scared of little too, planes. Well, and it, uh, the C-54 is not super small. Yeah, that's not too 50 small. people. You know, it's about uh, almost 100 feet long, you know, probably 120 feet wingspan. So it's not like a tiny plane, but I mean, it's smaller than like a 747. Yeah. Um, but it it's those it's those prop engines on the outside i think now with with the technology we have it scares me to go not that i'm scared of flying but the idea of hurtling through the air mm-hmm. at thousands of miles an hour is uh, unfathomable but when you look in a friend of mine's a pilot for southwest what's up Meredith? she just posted a interior picture of one of the new giant boeing aircraft mm. it's just computers in there mm-hmm. there's i mean she knows how to push all the buttons but you see now that it's all so automated, seeing these older planes, I mean, back then you were just, it was a wing and a prayer. You took your life in your <laughs> Literally. hands. Literally. I mean, it was, it's so much math. Everything, you had to, you had to rely on compasses and mm-hmm. which were impacted by magnets. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, have you ever been in an old timey airplane? No. Just like on a tour? Oh, maybe at an, um, like an air like show. Like Mobile, Alabama. I think there's like a naval base type thing. There was probably one there. Yeah, you can climb up in them at Addison every once in a while, every couple of months, probably not so much in COVID, but for a while there, they'd, they'd park them and you'd pay five bucks or 20 bucks or whatever to go walk up in them. And the, you know, the bombers, this was, I think the DC or the C-54 was in the, built in the forties, but uh, yeah, those, those old planes. Are these just, the ones that you just, it's just you sitting in this thing? It's basically <laughs> like you're in well, a canoe with wings? Uh, the, I think the ones more for the, um, what sort of like military use, but I I believe this one was outfitted with seats for passengers. Oh, so okay. instead of like just benches, yeah, 
But the fighter pilot ones where you're just like in there, it's just like, I mean, you, the, the body of the plane is, you know, just like feet from your face. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they, they had the, uh, the bombers back in the, you know, in the world war two bombers down in the little, or the gunner positions down in the bottom. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, you know, remember when you're a little kid and you're climbing through the tubes at discovery zone, mm-hmm. boy, do they have discovery zones anymore? Man, I loved my brother, my middle brother we had so many birthday parties for him back in the day at discovery Discovery zone Zone. Mm -hmm. uh or showbiz pizza or whatever Mm -hmm. and you get in that plastic bubble and you're you know as a kid you're all crammed in there imagine being a dude crammed in there so but yeah so anyways all that to say uh, it was state-of-the-art for the time (laughs) (laughs) i have nightmares about being trapped in really small places Mm -hmm. and one a recurring one is i'll be trying to climb out of something and the space will just keep getting smaller and smaller and all like mm. get stuck. That's why cave diving, mm-hmm. uh, any kind of it, when people not not just underwater cave diving, but like cave exploration when they'll crawl. What is it? Spelunking? I guess so. When, you know, you crawl through just like the tunnels of caves, but you're not it's... you're not in water. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. I'm not going to do it. It's so. called uh, a one way ticket to hell is no, what thank I call you. it. One one way ticket to cut your arm off, Phil. Yes, due to being stuck. I don't like I any ha- of that. I don't have that that kind of the kind of gumption it takes. I'll just die. I'll just be like, well, that's my time. I feel like <laughs> I cut my arm off with a pocket knife. Well, no, good would, for you. Yeah, it's like uh, Winnie the Pooh. I just get stuck, and I'd be like, well, this is where. Leave me. <laughs> no, <laughs> nice knowing you. Just set my phone up. Just put it on, um, I don't know, put it on Handmaid's Tale. That's what I'm really into right now. Are you really? So let me see how that ends. Why are you, why are you watching it when we're living it? <laughs> Top of Dude, I remember when, oh man, what was it? Probably five years ago. I don't remember when it came out. But when it did, I remember saying to Tommy, you know, we're not, this is set in the future, but not <laughs> that distant of a future. And honestly, I kind of feel like this is going to happen like pretty soon in our lifetime. And you know. Look at that. Yeah, Taking look, steps. look at where we are now. <laughs> well, I'm watching Breaking Bad, so. I keep meaning to tell Tommy we got to rewatch that. Can't I also want to start it. Mayor of Easttown, which people I have. People been talking about people it. People have been talking about it, and I'm, I'm interested. In 1972, the perils of the Alaska Triangle received national attention when House Majority Leader Hale Boggs and Alaskan Representative Nick Bejik vanished while traveling aboard a Cessna 310. On October 16th, the two men were traveling from Anchorage to Juneau, right in the middle of the triangle, on the way to a campaign fundraiser for Bejik, who was defending his seat from a challenger. The two politicians, Russell Brown, who was an aide, and Don Johns, the pilot, were all aboard the small craft. When the plane mysteriously disappeared, one of the nation's largest ever search and rescue missions was launched. See, these are the types of planes I don't mm-hmm. want to go on. Yes. This is, what kind of plane was JFK Jr. on? Oh, that's a great question. Let it was look. a tiny plane. Piper Saratoga. Mm. So Piper PA-32R. It's a six-seat, single-engine, all-metal, fixed-wing aircraft. And then the Cessna, seat, the Cessna 310 is a uh, four- to six-seater. It's a low-wing versus the, yeah, it's a twin-engine monoplane. So it's got See, I'm sure the Piper was a better plane, if anything, just because it was more advanced given the time. And look what happened to JFK Jr. It's true. Yeah, I mean, the, it's it, his. We should do an episode on that. I, I, I'm fascinated. JFK Jr. Well, yeah, and, and I'm fascinated by aircraft disasters, mm-hmm. as you can tell from my um, aircraft obsessions, and then also just all the conspiracies that have come after uh, of him still being alive and all that. Which, who knows? Uh, I'm just kidding. I don't think he is. It's very sad. Oh, I was going say, he's on Princess Diana's Island, according to some oh, on TikTok. Oh, that's right. That's but, right. Uh, but yeah, no, you're right. I, and the thing is, these planes are not inherently dangerous, but I feel like they are more accessible. Ergo, you're going to have more crashes for a plane that's more accessible versus having 747s crash where they don't let you sit in that without thousands and thousands of hours. Right. Whereas... Any dummy can go, if you got a checkbook and enough money in the bank, you can just go buy yourself a Cessna 310, and it doesn't take that many hours to get behind the the, the yoke. Oh, that's so scary. 
Yeah, that's the scary part about it. I think that's what the misconception is. They're dangerous planes. They're not dangerous planes. They're accessible planes Mm -hmm. for dangerous pilots. And Mm -hmm. and I fully believe in our right as Americans to travel freely throughout the skies. I remember when I first started taking flying lessons (laughs) with Tim, I said, you can just you just like fly wherever you want. And he said, yeah. I said, what? He's like, there's rules, but yeah, they don't, I mean, you just go wherever you want. It seems so like, it's wild. I guess with roads, you have to go a certain way. And with planes, there are, you know, there's regulations, like he said, and rules, even if you're flying without a, you know, a a flight plan on, on file with the air traffic control, but it's still so, I just felt like we could, if you were unhinged, you could just fly the plane into something. Yeah, people like, have. And they have. And so that's I think that's the misconception is, oh, these are dangerous planes. But who knows? I mean, and Don Johns may have been a really good pilot, but something goes wrong in it. There's that, too, because yeah. a lot of times they're maintained by the owner versus Southwest. Your airplane's right. maintained by a million. And American Airlines, they have a whole flight crew and checklist and stuff. And you should. But that's the same thing as saying, like, oh, people people take care of their cars. Well, some people do. But unhinged people can also just drive their car into a building or a crowd of people and do that as well. But I get what you're saying about the sky. It's there's not there's not traffic in the sky. You're not having to, like, go around other planes. I mean, I mean, you can see them on the radar. You're supposed to. I learned if you're going one way, you fly at one altitude, like odd altitudes and go another way. You fly. at Oh, okay. So it keeps you from from uh, crashing into each other. But it's I need parameters. I need a lane. (laughs) I need. I need white lines to show. I need rumble Thanks. strips. There's no I, white lines in the sky. It's just loose. <laughs> There's it not wild. a rumble strip in the sky either. It's He's not- like, pull it, pull it up. Let's go. And you just, you change altitude. And boy, you got to watch that altimeter because you just go without, I mean, we were flying above. What happens if you accidentally get way too high? Oh, you'll lose consciousness. Because the, <gasps> those, the smaller aircrafts aren't, you know, they're not sealed up for that. So if you're, you shouldn't fly that high or you will, you will pass out. Would you would something start like beeping in the yeah. plane to let you know you're getting too high? Yes. If you maintained it properly, yes. And if you did all your pre flight there's a whole pre flight checklist you gotta do. You know, you really have to take your time when you're you're so you would hope that everyone does that, but I think not everybody does. They don't know what caused this this crash with Hale Boggs and old representative Nick, but who there's so it's there I think there's a lot more variables with a small plane. I don't blame the plane, I just blame it's circumstance. Don't blame the plane. Blame the game. <laughs> Probably also, if you encounter treacherous weather, it's not going to stand up to it as well as a big, heavy 747 would. Well, true. And also, nowadays, it's a little bit better. But back then, you didn't have the same technology that you would have in a larger aircraft. And so nowadays, you have an iPad or you can have an iPad with something called ForeFlight on it, which is, you know, it gives you the all the radar, weather, everything you need to know. That even if you're in a small dress down plane, which I mean, I think the Cessna 310s were made in like the mid 50s and they stopped making them in the late 70s. And so you're if you can go buy a well-maintained Cessna 310 and the thing with airplanes, their engines have like so many hours that they can live and then you replace the engine. But if you replace the engine, it'll keep going. The rest of the plane will keep going. You know, it's you can maintain it. It's like a classic car. Mm -hmm. But that technology is not going to be in there. I guess you could retrofit the technology. But having that iPad now, I think. Hopefully that would reduce aircraft cl- crashes because you have higher power technology even in a dressed down smaller aircraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tommy's grandfather had a small plane That's and right. they would go flying around all the time. Sometimes they his grandmother would be like, I want seafood for dinner and they just fly to Galveston. Man, that's and, cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's I said it's freedom. You just go wherever you want. Well, for the next month, A search party made up of 50 civilian planes, 40 military aircraft, and dozens of boats scoured 32,000 square miles looking for the men or any sign of their plane, according to Legends of America. No trace of them or the aircraft was ever found, and the men were declared legally dead. While no bodies or wreckage were discovered, one positive that came of the incident was Congress passing a law mandating the installation of emergency locator transmitters in all U.S. civilian aircraft. So they didn't have that prior to that? Not all of them. So if your plane, now if a plane goes down, this transmitter, unless I guess it's destroyed in the wreck, would alert uh, search and rescue as to where it was? Yeah, and I think the idea is that it's 
transmitting. So it's like, okay, even if it goes offline, the last beep was here. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. And also, I think, you know, people are traveling with their phones or their iPads and mm-hmm. stuff. So I, I would imagine this would not be as common today. But four people on a small plane, 50 civilian airplanes, 40 military aircraft. So you have 90 aircraft in the sky, boats, and that's a, that's a huge search and rescue mm-hmm. mission. But 32,000 miles is a huge area to search as well. Yes. Yeah. Especially when we'll get into the glaciers because I think the it's glaciers, blaming, the gla- I, glaciers I, to blame. I think the glaciers have something to say about this. Yes. As someone who has watched uh, hundreds of hours on Mount Everest documentaries and mm-hmm. other mo- glaciers and mountains, dude, don't fuck with them. <laughs> You take you out. Take you out. (laughs) Most attributed the absence of debris, wreckage, and bodies to the harsh terrain. Conspiracy theorists wondered if then FBI director J. Edgar Hoover had orchestrated the disappearance, as he was known to be at political odds with Boggs, according to Strange Outdoors. Still, others postulated something otherworldly was at play and responsible for what became of the aircraft and men. Some people also think. There was something that the two politicians were transporting Mm. that the search and rescue effort was not to find them, but was to find whatever uh, item they had on the plane, whether it was documents or some some top secret item. And that's the only you know, that would be an explanation for why such an expensive and uh, extensive search and rescue mission was conducted when the government's involved. Nobody but them knows what's going it's, on. They will. They'll. They do what they want. Mm-hmm. While it is no secret, Alaska is home to both grizzlies and black bears. A far more vicious fur-covered beast is the creature known as the kushtika. According to Cryptid Wiki, kushtikas are mythical shape-shifting creatures found in the legends of the Clinket people. Able to shape-shift into both otters and human form, the kushtika are said to often appear to travelers as a relative or a child in need, preying on the traveler's emotions. If the kushtika is successful in its efforts, the victim is lured to a body of water where the vicious beast rips them limb from limb. If those that are unfortunate enough to cross paths with the kushtika are spared this horrific death, they are instead turned into a fellow kushtika. That's a... The myth of them is that they maybe are preying on your worst fears or but it's definitely a, an ongoing legend that kind of everybody in this area knows about would you rather be ripped limb from limb by a kushtika or turned into a kushtika and then you have to be the one to rip other travelers limb from limb i don't mean to be picky but you use the phrase have to rip other travelers <laughs> limb from limb what if I get to? Okay. There you are. Yes, I'm sure it is a choice. There are friendly kushtikas as well as vicious kushtikas, just like in humans. And what if there's some travelers that need ripping? You know what? I'm gonna I'm choosing kushtika. Same. Me too. Because well, you kush- could still go together. visit your family. That's true too. They, you know? Especially if you could shape shift. Yeah. Everybody well Everybody used to like otters until I ruined otters oh, for everyone right. on a right. previous episode. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, you, I'm hap- I will happily become a kushtika. I don't want to become an otter because those are the real <laughs> monsters. <laughs> Others claim the kushtikas are benevolent creatures and turn lost travelers into kushtikas as a means to help them survive the freezing conditions. One woman from Texas who believes she encountered a kushtika on a summer vacation in Alaska told the Travel Channel... It looked like a giant bird with a beak-like face. While the woman did not speak to the demeanor of the kushtika, she did claim the bird man stood above her as she was attacked by a flock of crows until she ran away. It is unclear whether the bird man and the crows were in cahoots together. Well, they were saying that the kushtika will take your biggest fear, and she said that she was very scared. They wouldn't say Alfred Hitchcock's movie Birds, but she said, there's a movie where birds fly down and attack people. Did you mean birds? Was it birds that you were trying to say? So she had that fear already that she had seen it as a kid. So she was afraid of birds, the movie, Mm. and I guess the creature. And so the Kushtika took on this thing that would scare her. And she said it was a giant man with a beak-like face. And the reenactment 
uh, showed her bloodied armed and running away. And then she said uh, later she spoke with an indigenous person who said, well, if you escape from the Kushtika, then that shows that you have a, a strong spirit or a strong soul that you could survive. Well, if you can survive the Kushtika, I imagine you can survive anything. I think including so. Including a flock of ravenous birds. What would the Kushtika take on for you? Oh, God. Would it all of a sudden turn into the leprechaun? Yeah, it would shrink down and be a leprechaun. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, it probably would be. Honestly. Would it? Oh, God. Were there multiple ones? Oh, a family of Kushtikas and there's just multiple. No, just, multiple leprechauns. That's what I mean. And then yeah. they all shrink down to multiple leprechauns. I don't like that. Like Mine that. would probably be big ass Spider. water bugs. I was gonna say brown recluse. Um, man, do I want to battle a kushtika sized brown recluse or a kushtika sized water bug? Either of them are gross. Every time I think of giant spiders, I think of wild wild west. Yeah, a giant brown recluse could certainly kill you with a bite easily. A water bug couldn't. <laughs> I would just have a heart attack from pure fear. Yeah, I will just throw up until I choked on my own throw up. I, I, either way, I'm dead. So I guess it really doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like, do you want to drown to death or be burned to death? Six either way, one. either way, exactly. Is that it? Do people, do, Paris says, why do you say six of one? I said, because it's a phrase, six of one, half a dozen of another. He said, I've never heard anyone really? say Really? That. That's, that's a thing. I say it all the time. I say it all the time. Well, it means it doesn't matter because they're both the same. Exactly. Yeah. And if you you... You just say that first half because the six on, six or one, yeah. Then then the speaker that finishes it anyway, or you just or the know listener. what it means, yeah, yeah. The listener it's like, finishes it. It's in their like head. Uh, oh no, that one's not it. I was gonna say tomato tomato, but that's the whole phrase. Because if you just said tomato, the people wouldn't know. <laughs> You're like, Why no, are you just yelling like, tomato at me? No, no, thank you. I just had lunch. <laughs> but there's another one. Dang it! I almost had it again. Hmm. Hmm. I don't remember it. I'll think of it in a second. According to Alaska for Real, a well-known local myth, possibly involving a Kushtika, is the legend of Thomas Bay. The story goes that a prospector named Charlie, despite all warnings, tried digging for riches in the southern Alaskan area known as Thomas Bay. Feared and revered by those who live nearby, Thomas Bay is called Devil's Country by the local Klingit people and known by others as the Bay of Death due to how many people have died in landslides and shipwrecks in the bay. Before old Charlie could return from his mission with his newfound riches, he faced down a nightmare among the trees. Charlie told the story to other would-be prospectors in June of 1900, saying, Swarming up the ridge toward me from the lake were the most hideous creatures. I couldn't call them anything but devils as they were neither men nor monkeys, yet looked like both. They were entirely sexless. Their bodies covered with long, coarse hair, except where the scabs and running sores had replaced it. Each one seemed to be reaching out for me and striving to be the first to get me. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, they told you don't go in that area. <laughs> Charlie. Gotta get my gold. Yeah, Charlie. I mean, they were just protecting their land. I think so. It's his fault. For someone running from them as fast as he could, he sure got a good look at them it's to true. be able to describe them in great detail to other prospectors well i suppose if they were swarming towards him he got him in the view and then mm. was like oh shit and turn around and ran but yeah if, if there's an area called the bay of death <laughs> you don't need to dig there no. i think you're good i, I think if I'm you dig going. there whatever that comes up that's on you do you think it's possible charlie was uh spinning a tail as they say so other prospectors Ooh. wouldn't go looking for the gold that's a good point. That's a good point. He's trying to keep him away because mm -hmm. he found his, he found the riches. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, maybe. Uh, it's one of those, uh, I guess, what do you call it? It's not really an urban legend, but it's kind of a story told over and over again. Yeah. Or just a, an otter having a bad day. Dude, stay away from the fucking otters. <laughs> an otter having a real bad hair day. He'd had a night. He's got and... the mange. <laughs> yes. Sinisterhood will be right back. Uh, you know my hair is a mile long. I'm not exaggerating. Your hair is a mile long. That is not an exaggeration. I mean, it's past my back. 5,280 feet long. It yes, really I do know how many feet a mile is. Hey, um, it's crazy. And it's hard to take care of because there's so much of it all the time. And I was just using store-bought shampoo from CVS or Walgreens or whatever. And it wasn't doing the trick. It was okay. But I have found something that's so much better. 
so much better. So, so much better. I was recently using another brand that I just recently learned is described by Gen Zers as chuggy. Can't use that. So I can't use that anymore because I got to be <laughs> hip. And I'll tell you what, Pros is super hip. And the packaging, when I received my custom shampoo and conditioner, delightful. Beautiful. It was fantastic. It was yes. so beautiful. And you know what? I, it's hard to say it because there's no one size fits all when it comes to shampoo and conditioner. We need products that are suited for our unique needs and don't leave us disappointed. And thanks to my personalized pro shampoo and conditioner, I fall in love with my long, long, luscious hair again. There's so much to fall in love with. Pros knows there's more to you than just your hair type. They've given over 1 million consultations with their in-depth hair quiz, which is how I got started. I was fascinated by this quiz. Did you know that it takes into account the zip code mm-hmm. where you live? Because environmental factors in the area where you live could cause your hair to be damaged by certain pollutants. And I, you- found, I was like... They think of everything. And you know there's a lot of stuff in our air. Oh, here. yes. Between, you know, smog from the cars, but also allergens and all kinds of stuff. So I love that. So their algorithm and over 50 billion formula combinations, pros determined a unique blend of ingredients to treat all my exact hair concerns down to the zip code. That's amazing. If you're not 100% positive, pros is the best hair care you've ever had. They will take the products back. No questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair quiz and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash creepy. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash creepy for your free in-depth hair quiz and 15% off. Heather, everyone knows now we do not cook. Mm -mm. But even the thought of cooking, Mm -hmm. which I don't do, exhausts me. It makes me so tired. There's so many dishes And also, Mm -hmm. I have to go and get stuff from the store, and I'm not going to do that. Mm -mm. But that means I don't usually eat vegetables because I'm eating chips or crackers or whatever. The easiest thing to grab. I found Daily Harvest. I have been eating broccoli and cheese bowl. I -hmm. have my delicious smoothies with strawberry bananas. I'm telling you, I've eaten more of the flatbreads, so it tricks me into eating vegetables. But on a flatbread, I've had more vegetables since we started Daily Harvest than I've had probably in the last 30 years. And honestly... If I'm not eating that, I'm eating takeout, and I feel like crap when I eat takeout. Mm-hmm. So this changed. So the Daily Harvest, it delivers these delicious foods, all built on organic fruits and vegetables. They come right to your door. It takes literally minutes to prepare, and I don't have to think twice about the food I'm eating and whether it's good for me or not, because I know it is. Mm-hmm. Daily Harvest is ready when you are. Also, everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it, so you waste less food. There's no need to overthink any of your meals for the week with Daily Harvest. You get smoothies for breakfast. Crisp flatbreads, which are so yummy for lunch or dinner, and food that's good for all types of weather. They have soups, bowls, ice cream. The ice cream is so good, and it's like healthy ice cream, so you can eat all of it and still not feel that bad about yourself. And especially because Daily Harvest never uses preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything, including their recently launched almond milk, which is made of only almonds and a dash of sea salt. That is it. So it's super convenient because you're always stocked up. You don't have to run out of milk when you're trying to make your smoothies. Daily Harvest is also committed to minimizing their environmental impact. They're in the process of transitioning to 100% compostable, recyclable, plant-based, and renewable fiber packaging. Get started today. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code CREEPY to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code CREEPY for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. It's dailyharvest.com. Another cryptid local to Alaska is the Ureuli, a giant but gentle creature standing between 6 and 10 feet tall with shaggy fur and glowing eyes. Described by those who have seen him as looking like an ancient primate, the Ureuli's arms dangle so long they can reach his feet. Known for living a quiet and peaceful existence, it is doubtful the Ureuli would be responsible for the disappearance of those that have gone missing. However, an almost identical creature, known simply as the Hairy Man, is also said to walk among the Alaskan wilderness. The one difference between him and the Ureuli? His ability to rip a man to shreds. Could the Kushtika, the Hairy Man, or perhaps both, be the reason the bodies of those missing are rarely, if ever, recovered? Perhaps, but this still doesn't explain the missing aircrafts. The best part was watching the Alaska Triangle oh, show, man. and the they're talking about Harry Man. I was Paris was playing video games, and I was watching it on my iPad, and he was only hearing every once in a while. And he said, "What are you watching about a Harry Man?" It's like it's obviously a cryptid for the show. I'm not just into <laughs> weird videos online. Uh, in any way, I'd be wearing my headphones if I was. 
But I, it sounds wild to say that I think the explanation could be cryptids, but not necessarily cryptids, but definitely undiscovered or animals that scientists are not familiar with that look like this or certain mm-hmm. type of bear, subspecies of bear. I don't know, some type of primate. You can't say that there's thousands and thousands of square feet of wilderness and then not and then equivocally say unequivocally say, oh, there's none. I, there's no Euregula. It doesn't exist. It could there could be something out there. It could be a saber tooth tiger. We don't know. Whoa, yeah, that'd be wild. And on the Travel Channel Alaska Triangle show, they talk about how in the 1900s at the Port Chatham, Port Port Chatham, I think I heard it pronounced both ways. The town that it was like a fishing town where um, people went and and settled, and then body parts started washing up Mm-mm. in the in the waters and stuff and they and the logs of the the captain said that something was in the woods and it was it was spooking them too bad so they all packed up and left see there's there could be stuff hiding out there and it's just so un undiscovered we can't know mhm could also be just like a monster bear <laughs> Mega like bear. Like a giant, like a mega bear. Yeah. Could be. It's one, it's three bears stacked on top of each other in a <laughs> trench coat. <laughs> While vicious ape like creatures may account for disappearances on land, a different monster is credited for those that vanish on the water. Called the Alaskan Loch Ness Monster, the Iliamna Lake Monster is a large water cryptid that lurks in the depths of the enormous Iliamna Lake. Those who have seen it describe it as a dragon or serpent like creature between 12 and 20 feet long. Could this Alaskan Nessie be capable of dragging boaters to the bottom of the enormous lake? The people that have seen it, much like Nessie or Bigfoot, swear they have seen it. There's cell phone footage. So if you watch the footage, it does look like there is a giant serpent. Not quite. I wouldn't say it's quite like a Nessie. I would say it's more like a long dragon beneath or the water. Or a whale. It's skinny. It's like not skinny, but it's not quite whaleish. It's more I'm I'm moving my arm like a wave. It's kind of, like a like a yeah, like a giant worm, like a sandworm oh. but in the water. That's worse. <laughs> That's worse than a serpent. As if a lake monster wasn't enough to contend with. Some believe that extraterrestrial UFOs use the deep waters around the Alaska Triangle as a base of operations. In 1969, Dan Willis, a naval communications officer and certified high-speed code operator, had an unbelievable experience in a code room in San Francisco. Willis, who held the highest security clearance, told the Travel Channel he received a highly unusual message in Morse code from a ship off the coast of Alaska. The crew reported a brightly glowing reddish-orange elliptical object approximately 70 feet in diameter that emerged out of the ocean, then shot straight up into space. The radar operator tracked the blip at going in excess of 7,000 miles per hour. Based on the technology at the time, Willis believed the blip to be an extraterrestrial. After his experience, he began hunting UFOs in Alaska. In an interview with the Travel Channel, Willis claimed he found a number of reports of discs coming out of the ocean near Alaska dating back to 1945 and continuing on throughout the years. Yeah, there's one where a couple of sailors on a, a naval ship saw something like this, a disc shoot up out of the out of the water, and what do you think it is? I think it sounds like a Tic Tac. <laughs> Remember? I think it sounds like a giant Tic Yes, yeah. There's been hundreds of UFO sightings reported over the Triangle, so... Mm-hmm. I did look up what the states with the most UFO reports. Alaska was four. I'm going to say number one, mm, I was going to say New Mexico, but I don't think that's right. Arizona. Mm. No. Vermont, Montana. Really? Alaska and Maine with Washington State at number one. Wow, I was way off. Yeah. Interesting. So Texas has one of the lowest. Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. So for what up, haters, being like, I saw a flying <laughs> chalupa in the sky. Nope. Turns out it's all the Pacific Northwesterners. That's interesting. Either that or the aliens came to the south and went, nah, I'm good. Nah, yeah, I want those uh, lush green forests up there. (laughs) They're like, no thanks. 
Everything that Willis has gathered follows a general pattern. Unidentified flying objects rise up from under the ocean and then shoot off at an incredible speed. Some believe that UFOs may be accessing wormholes under the water and make their bases in deep areas of the ocean off the coast of both Alaska and California. If this is true, is it possible that planes, boats, and those on board have been abducted and are living out their lives in another galaxy or dimension? There's a, a whole set of people that their job is to research underwater alien bases. That's a hell of a job. I mean, isn't it? I'm telling you. We t- someone what was one of our Patreon Q&A questions was, have you guys joined MUFON yet? And I said, we haven't joined, but I learned that there's a whole internal infrastructure in MUFON. And someone is like, the Northwest Regional Director of Research. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's your whole job. What the hell? Yeah. Lucky. Alien spacecraft isn't only thought to emerge from the deep waters surrounding Alaska. On a flight from Paris to Tokyo on November 17, 1986, a 747 cargo plane had a strange encounter. Japan Airlines Flight 1628 was flying at an altitude of 35,000 feet when it was approached by what its captain believed to be military aircraft. On the recording of the communications from the flight, Captain Teruchi asked Anchorage Air Traffic Control whether there was traffic at the plane's 7 o'clock location. The ATC confirmed, telling Teruchi, Uh, Roger, sir. I'm picking up a hit on the radar approximately 5 miles and trail your 6 o'clock position. ATC soon confirmed with the military base at Elmendorf that the three crafts trailing the 747 were not their planes. In seconds, the lighted object shot from behind and below the 747, coming face-to-face with the 747's cockpit, defying any currently available technology. The craft then blasted lights into the cockpit, temporarily blinding the crew. Then, as quickly as they came upon him, the lights were gone, with Captain Terucci telling ATC, And now the traffic is uh, extinguished. We cannot see now. But just moments later, a craft ten times larger than the 747 approached the cargo plane, showing up on the radar of both Anchorage ATC and the military base at Elmendorf. Once the flight crew stepped off the plane in Anchorage, they spoke with Federal Aviation Administration representatives, described as scared, sincere, and believable. By the FAA, the crew related their story. Then Captain Terucci drew the UFO, which looked like a circular vessel that would be the size of a 6,000-passenger cruise ship according to the FAA on the Travel Channel. This is the most, I think, legitimate, one of the most legitimate UFO sightings that's been recorded. Should I tell you what I read about it then? Please spoil it. (laughs) I'm just saying what I read. Captain Terucci was known for reporting seeing UFOs. This was like his fourth or fifth time to report seeing a UFO. They wanted Are they him. they targeting him? Yes, they or wanted does him. he think everything is UFO? Who's to say? Also, a lot of the crew reported they did not see exactly what he saw. They just saw lights, mm-hmm. which a lot of said could have been lights from many different things. So... There were some inconsistencies and his credibility was a bit called into question because they said he's kind of he kind of is the the pilot who cried wolf like he's just (laughs) yelling about UFOs. Yeah, he's crying. He's talking about UFOs all the time. So when do we know when to believe? But pilot who cried alien. I want that children's book. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they're targeting him. Maybe they're trying to to communicate with him. You know, I mean, what better way to go un undetected than by targeting the same person over and over and essentially making them feel like they're losing it. They're ga- the aliens are gaslighting him. They're monsters. They're so mean. <laughs> the drawing, which we got to, we got to put on the Instagram. <laughs> it's like a, it, it looks like a children's toy, I will say, but <laughs> they did say that it's, that it was seen on radar on both, the Something was seen on radar, yes. Anchorage ATC and the military base, Elmendorf, saw it on radar and then it disappeared. And that's not that was not possible at the time. And that they would they said in the past they had seen Russian air because of course it's this what year was this? Eighty six. So it's like the Cold War. So they were on alert for Russian aircrafts anyway, mm-hmm. and they said they would have had to see the Russian aircraft coming into their space 
and then leaving their space, this appeared and disappeared. So, uh, I mean, what do you think it was? I think it could have been a UFO. I believe in in life on other planets and mm-hmm. that they they visit. I also think a lot of these sightings could be government planes, military planes that they just you're on a need to know basis mm. and they're either the people, the ATC, they're not uh it's above their pay grade to know what's going on mm-hmm. or they do know what's going on but the it's above the pilot's pay grade so, so they're just going to you know, tell them. I think a lot of things can be military testing, and I I don't want to sound like I'm putting my tinfoil hat on, but the government does a lot of shit <laughs> that we don't know about. They're, we're not privy to most of what goes on, uh, in my opinion, with the with those guys. I think so, it's, unless they want us to know, we don't know. Yes, and we rarely do they want us to know. Correct. They want us to know what they want us to know. So, yeah, I mean, it could have been a misunderstanding, you know, uh, they there's just some lights from some boats or something they're seeing. Reflection. I don't know. Yeah. The fact that it showed up on radar does make it seem like there was an aircraft in the sky. So I would say UFO or a military plane that they were not aware of. Super secret military mm-hmm. plane being tested. It could be that. And I think that was some of the theories that are put forth for the unidentified aerial phenomena that we covered as well. That mm-hmm. it could be. Exactly what you said. The people that see it are, I'm a high-ranking pilot in the Navy or in the Air Force. I've been a pilot for 25 years. I've never seen anything like it. And they said that they, you know, the my bosses said they weren't testing anything. Well, would they tell everybody yeah. everything? You know, if you don't need nah. to know. <sighs> Too many cooks. <laughs> That's right. Re- rewatched that recently. <laughs> so funny. S- still great. Still great. <laughs> <laughs> that holds up. Sinister Hood will be right back. This show is brought to you by our show's new sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy. We try our hardest to take care of our bodies, but what about our minds? Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. There's a misunderstanding of what therapy is. It can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be sitting around talking about your feelings or that's exactly what it can be. It's up to you. I have talked before about how obsessed I am with my BetterHelp therapist. I love her so much. Recently, she said to me, it's not good or bad. It is, which has been I have a lot of negative self-talk about certain things. And that's so helpful not to label things that you do or say, just understanding that you are what you are and what you've done. And then also she said, most shit don't matter, which is hilarious and also true. So I'm having a great time. <laughs> oh, man, I am going I'm taking the quiz to find a new uh, therapist with better help. And I hope I get matched with the same one. <laughs> Love her. You did. I wonder if you can just request her. Uh, Maybe I'll, I'll do that. Give you her name. She's great. Well, when everyone is struggling with something, there's no more shame. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Sinisterhood listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Sinister. That's B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash sinister. By now, pretty much everyone has heard of CBD, and if there was ever a time to get it started with CBD, it is now. What both scientists and those who use CBD regularly know is that it helps with daily stresses. But you have to use quality products to get quality results. Charlotte's Web hemp extracts are tested 20 plus times from seed to final product. Unlike many companies, Charlotte's Web has their own proprietary hemp genetics. So the end products are consistent, meaning you know exactly what to expect from each bottle. And they're a mission-driven B Corp, which just means that they promise to help the planet and humanity and all that good stuff, which we're all trying to do. Love right? it. Love it. My... I, I got some gummies on the way. Do you? Oh, Super good. Super stoked about it. Yeah. I love my, you yeah. know I love my gummies. I was going to say this allergy mm-hmm. in Texas, all the cottonwood has wrecked my hands due to eczema to the point that I couldn't even wear my engagement ring anymore. But my CBD medic eczema ointment helps stop the itching and inflammation and the dryness, and I can wear my ring again. Yay! Go to charlottesweb.com to get started with the OG CBD brand who kicked off this whole CBD craze and use code CREEPY at checkout to save 15% on your order. This code works on all CBD products besides bulk bundles. That's charlottesweb.com. Use code CREEPY to save 15% on your order today. 
Perhaps another explanation for the 16,000 that have vanished in the Alaska Triangle can be attributed to a powerful energy vortex. According to Legends of America, energy vortexes are swirling centers of energy that are highly concentrated in certain areas, causing an intense effect on both people and objects. Positive vortexes spiral upward in a clockwise motion, creating healing energy, and are often associated with the pyramids in Egypt, Stonehenge, and Sedona, Arizona. People often report feeling creatively charged and physically, mentally, and emotionally healed after visiting places known for positive energy vortexes. You've been to Sedona? Oh, yes. It's very positive. It's such a beautiful did you have, place. Did you feel charged creatively and healed spiritually? I think so. We went on the vortex and uh, you stand there and you kind of let it absorb into you. And we sat there for a long time and... I went with my improv troupe, so how much more uh, creatively charged can you get? So there was a a point that you could hike to or stand on that's specifically known for being the energy vortex? I think there's five. So we went to oh, one of them. Cool. So yeah, so there's, you know, and I think some are more busier than others and things like that. But it was mm-hmm. a beautiful place to hike. And the whole city is just positive, radiating. It was just a good, positive, happy experience. We were also there for a very lovely wedding. So, But Mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to get married because, you know, you're starting your marriage off kind of with like this good vibes and energy. Mm -hmm. But I did feel refreshed and rejuvenated after that trip. I want to go. I've always wanted to go. It's beautiful. While vortexes spiraling upward produce positive effects, those spiraling downward in a counterclockwise motion have been thought to suck the energy from those in its path causing depression, disorientations, and hallucinations. This negative energy has also been known to impact electrical instruments on planes and ships. According to Only In Your State, pilots and boat captains have reported having their compasses malfunction when in the triangle, causing them to veer off course by up to 30 degrees. Some have also claimed to hear strange sounds coming from the skies, similar to a swarm of bees. Well, if one vortex can lift you up, the other one can suck you down, I guess. Yeah, I mean, amen. Paige Bryant, author of TerraVision, A Traveler's Guide to the Living Planet Earth, says in her book, A vortex is a mass of energy that moves in a rotary or whirling motion, causing a depression or vacuum at the center. These powerful eddies of pure Earth power manifest as spiral-like coagulations of energy that are either electric, magnetic, or electromagnetic qualities of life force. Could the bizarre noises people are hearing be coming from a giant vortex vacuum in the sky? If so, the sound of swarming bees might be the last thing they hear before being sucked into another dimension. I'm uh, not a scientist, and I was trying to learn science before this show. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was looking up the, the correlation between vortexes and wormholes okay the wormhole that we think of from science fiction is i believe theoretical at this point because we cannot manipulate gravitational forces in order to create a wormhole that would suck between two planes of existence but some scientists in barcelona were able to manipulate magnets to the point of creating a vortex between the two magnets. I'll put it in the show notes. It was very interesting. It was only like a three minute video, but it felt like an entire textbook it was from the Discovery <laughs> Ch- Discovery Channel News. But they were saying that in theory, were we ever to be able to manipulate gravitational forces, we humans could figure out how to manipulate gravitational forces, that the, that study kind of gives you the blueprint that they're doing it with magnetic forces now, but if they figured out a way to manipulate gravitational forces, they would be able to create a wormhole that would let you travel between dimensions. That's a big if to like Einstein theory of relativity stuff, but which I still don't understand, but at least the theory is there. So I was trying to, my pea-sized brain was trying to figure out, all right, if there's such a powerful vortex there, would it be able to be so powerful that it's sucked up in a hole to another dimension? I, th- I think that's what a lot of people think is going on. And I think that the science is there. It's just we can't make it happen, but it could happen, if that makes sense. Like, we can't manipulate gravity to the point of creating a wormhole, but if there was a large amount of energy charged up, then I think it would be able to make it some type of a wormhole. 
and suck yeah, you. Yeah, I this. blacked out honestly halfway <laughs> through that conversation. I got. I got to. Pu- I'll publish the the Discovery Channel. It's not. I guess it's t- technically Discovery Channel. It's like D News or whatever. But I feel it's one of those where you you're like, I get it. I'm telling you, I listened to a quantum physics podcast one time, and at the end of it, I knew it, and 30 seconds later, it was gone. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's a lot of ifs with that. Yeah, we got to assume that there are other dimensions there that are. one could travel to. I believe that we have to assume that there is something going on at this location or possibly other areas where people think that these exist mm-hmm. that could create something like this that defies science. So there's a lot of leaps you got to take but if it's a negative energy vortex that's sucking down so hard why wouldn't it be able to suck gravity down and create exactly what we're talking about the worm blacked out again i blacked out (laughs) (laughs) no i think i think there yeah if like energy could create something like that i that is what this is saying is Mm -hmm. that the vortex could therefore suck things up like a ship or a plane. Mm-hmm. Therefore, there, that's why there's no bodies discovered or any planes or anything. Where do they land? They got sucked up in there. I mean, granted, take this with a grain of salt. You're talking to the kid that when I used to rub my eyes really hard, I thought I was in space. So I... Uh, I you thought you had like physically... Oh, man. Yeah. Like transported yourself like to a, space? As a little kid. I also was not as much anymore, but not totally not at all. But as a kid... <laughs> this is so dumb. This is the dumbest. This is more... Maybe more embarrassing than the creepy collection that I revealed on the Patreon Q&A. As a kid, I was worried that if I, when you take your shirt over your head and, you know, you know, it kind of blocks your vision, uh-huh. I was always worried that I would be, I would lift my shirt and be somewhere else. Like, if like I, when you put your shirt down, you would be somewhere else? Vice versa, whichever, pulling a shirt over your head or taking a shirt off that I would, it would be like a quantum leap kind of situation and I would end up. In another, like, time travel or go somewhere else. That's, why Why was the shirt the the catalyst? I think it was just not being able to see. It was like this fear of, oh, my God, if my sh- uh, if I can't see, I'm going to end up. That's stupid, right? That's so dumb. But I, st- I mean, kids are idiots, so. But I, I mean, they're, are they? They're not, I'm I not mean, calling you an idiot. I'm just saying kids come up with a bunch of weird shit. What so. a strange thing. Why would you ever think of that? But sometimes I still worry. <laughs> I, my I don't think my it's strange. For a child, uh, to th- <laughs> but it's because irrational for you me. Are, you are still learning, you know, about like object permeance and stuff. Like babies, That's they, they got to learn about that. Like that, just because they can't see something doesn't mean like it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe that just came a little later for little Heather. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I was, realization of object. I permeance. remember being really small and not and and thinking that, and then remembering that I was worried about it. And it's one of those where you go, there's no monster under the bed. Is there? <laughs> you know where- I mean, I'm 42 and I still freak myself out yeah. sometimes because I'm like, I can't dangle my arm off the bed. What if something <laughs> grabs me in the middle of the night? That the demon will take me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll realize like my closet door is halfway open and I'm like, I can't sleep with that no. happening all night. Because there's three windows. We have two in our bedroom and one in Paris's office that's adjacent to the bedroom that can see... And there, the curtains have to be completely sealing around the corner. And one time he had left his window open, and I said, "You got to get up and go close the drapes." And he said, "It's in, you know, it's the backyard. It's blocked off by a fence. The fence is locked." He's like, "Why do I have to close it?" I said, "Because as sure as you don't, there's going to be a fucking person standing there staring in the mm. window." So yeah, you know, stare all you want on the other side of the curtain. I just don't want to be able to see you. <laughs> That's true. Yes, I, I I feel the same way. Yes. Well, for those that subscribe to the Energy Vortex theory, an announcement from three scientists in 1992 certainly helps their case. Appearing on Anchorage's Channel 13 that year, the scientists claimed that while using seismic recording equipment to study the Earth's crust, they inadvertently discovered something underground, a pyramid structure larger than Cheops, referring to one of the pyramids of Giza, according to Strange Outdoors. What the hell, man? <laughs> It gets weirder. Retired U.S. Army counterintelligence warrant officer Douglas A. Mutchler recalled watching the broadcast at the time and again six months later when it aired on the local NBC affiliate. Suspiciously, when Mutchler contacted the station for a copy of the story, they denied ever running it. 
when Mutchler contacted members of his family to see if they had seen it on any other stations, they had not. The mysterious broadcast had only appeared on Anchorage's Channel 13. Convinced the government was covering up this discovery, Mutchler contacted famed ufologist Linda Moulton Howe. On July 26, 2012, Howe appeared on Coast to Coast AM, saying that since she first spoke to Mutchler, several other ex-military had contacted her, confirming that a giant pyramid allegedly built by an ancient civilization is buried beneath the triangle and has enough power to generate electricity for all of Alaska and even Canada, according to Strange Outdoors. Of course, there are some conspiracy theorists that have taken this a step further, accusing Howe herself of building the pyramid in an attempt to profit monetarily. I'm usually one for conspiracy theories, but I think that last bit is irrational because how is she she ain't selling tickets to go and visit it. How is I, she making yes, money off of it? I think because she would control the energy that it produced that it's generating and then she could generate the electricity for the states and con- I don't I, mean, I don't I know. Guess. It was, I think it was it was a lot. There's so much on top of it. It's it's from a long time how ago. How are you going to dig up and build how are you going to build a pyramid underground and nobody knows what you're doing? Yeah, so I'm like there, this was there before. I think she, yeah, yeah, she found it's there. It. Yeah, uh. I also, I gotta, I gotta say, Mutchler, how, how did nobody else see this, buddy? Uh, you know, with the how internet, nobody, how did nobody else? See I this was able story? to find Patrick Phillips, who is the late night uh, cable access. Uh, what do you call That's it? Right, television, did. whatever you want to. call I guess it was technically he was a television host. Uh, but so with the internet, if if you can make a, a strange connection like I have, then. One would think someone else who had seen the Channel 13 program would have reached out and tried to find someone else unless they've all been bumped off by the government. That's true. And there was no information as to whether Mutchler contacted Channel 13 himself and what they said. Mm -hmm. It was just that the NBC affiliate was like, we have no idea what you're talking about. We didn't we didn't run this. You're imagining things. Wow. You know, that makes you question reality. Mm hmm. While it's possible for cryptids, aliens, and ancient pyramids to be responsible for the hundreds of people that go missing each year in the Alaska Triangle, a more logical explanation may be the very thing that attracts so many to the frontier state in the first place. A vast, untouched wilderness of dense forests, millions of lakes, desolate tundra, and roughly 27,000 towering glaciers. While they often appear as solid formations of ice, Crevasses the size of large buildings occur throughout the glaciers, many dropping hundreds of feet below the surface, providing a permanent icy burial ground for those unfortunate enough to fall in. With regular snowfall and avalanches, the likelihood of planes or bodies being found in these is nearly impossible. Dude, these, I'm telling you, they're, I don't think you've watched it yet because you probably would have told me, but... The Touching the Void documentary. Oh, that's right. I have not yet. He falls into one of these. He touches the void. And granted, the reenactment is still filmed in in like a crevasse, though. Wild. Like, Mm -mm. I mean, and Mm -mm. some of these are big as houses. Yeah. So if a plane crashes into a glacier slides down or you know falls into one of these crev- and then it causes an avalanche which buries it bye bye you're not finding that that's a good point if the dc or what is it the douglas c54 was had a wingspan of like 120 feet i mean easily that's the size of a house yeah i mean or it just you know obliterates upon impact True. so it's just pieces falling down and the chunks and then the whole- snowfall and and stuff get just covered up forever interesting Tourists flock to Alaska each year to go camping and hiking. However, many are unprepared and underdressed for the extreme environment. Every year, more than 2,000 people are reported missing in Alaska. That's five people reported missing each year per 1,000. Hundreds of search and rescue missions are performed, most coming up empty-handed. Steep cliffs, massive crevasses, deep bodies of water, freezing temperatures, and dangerous wildlife are most likely why so many have never seen their loved ones again. Still, when nary a trace of hundreds of missing boats, planes, and people can be found, one starts to wonder if more sinister forces 
are at work. So what do we think? Well, I don't think there's one explanation that fits everything. Okay. But I do think there's energy vortexes that suck people into the sky. And I... <laughs> you do not. Do you really think this? I I, I understand I the science. I've watched this video. you got to watch the Discovery Channel video. It's three minutes long. But knowing that it's possible, I just also... Paris always turns on these science videos. And so it's one of those where I know enough to be dangerous. But listening to it, we just don't know enough about what's out there. We can't... Again, I think that with something like this where it's this type of mystery... I don't think that it, it. we as humans understand nature as much as we think we do. We d- uh, definitely understand it a lot, but I think that is why we still have scientists who are doing the experiments like those in Barcelona and quantum physicists trying to figure out and finish Einstein's theories that he came up with because there's still so much more and still so much more in space. I don't understand it enough to talk about it, but there's something about the earth has a wormhole to the sun. It's like, but it's just for energy. You can't fit through it anyway. But it's one of those where we're making discoveries every day. So maybe that's could something similar or or it happened and it caused the instruments to go out and then the plane crashed and fell in a crevasse. That's fine. But uh, there's too much going on with the magnetic stuff up there nearby Aurora Borealis, nearby the, the pole, which is shifting like 40 miles a year. So there's there's a lot going on up there that I think that has something to do with it, that the forces in the sky are playing a part. See, to me, it's not really a mystery. I think that it's, it's kind of makes sense that so many people go missing there because it's the largest state. Oh yeah. It has more square miles of wilderness and unexplored terrain than any state. There's like 10, there's 10 federal parks, I think. Yeah. And state parks, and too. People, like, I read all these things from rangers up there that are like, people don't realize what they're getting themselves into. No, they think they, they go can... hiking or they go camping. They're not dressed right. They get lost. You know, they get turned. And then they'll go looking for them. But there's just too many. It's too big of a place. And there's too much stuff for them to f- fall off a cliff, fall into a crevasse fall in a lake and because it's so cold they sink faster mm-hmm. than they would if it if it was warmer water and the so, Omni monster gets them too yeah maybe but i, th- I think so you're right it, it makes sense to me why so many people go go missing there and some sad articles i read were like sometimes people want to go missing mm-hmm. and that's why they specifically go there and you know because they know like they might not be found and so i think a lot of them probably the majority of them didn't intend to go to go missing, but I don't know. I think I, I do think of all of these, if I was going to subscribe to any theory that could play a part, it would be something having to do with energy that would affect electrical instruments and things like that. Mm-hmm. That there's some sort of magnetic issue, which now plane instruments are on GPS. That wouldn't be as big of an, uh, an issue as it was back in the 70s and 80s and before that. Uh, I think you're totally right, though. When you go... Uh, amateur level, you know, more novice hikers, It's it could get to be 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit there. So, I mean, it's harsh conditions. So you're right. Mm-hmm. If you're not prepared for that, easily you could freeze to death. And there's happy tales, too, where someone's gone missing and after a few days or whatever they're found sure. um, alive, you know, which is great. Yeah. But uh, so I think that's a big part of it is probably the amateurs side of it. I also, I don't think, I don't, I do not subscribe to the underwater alien base theory because I think the imagery that these folks were looking at, um, studying, because they were explaining that that's why these alien ships would shoot up out of the water would be because their base on Earth was down in the ocean. Although we've only explored something like, what is it, 5% of the ocean? So there's a lot down there we don't know. But I will say it looked just like the erosion of beaches but it was they had flattened out i think you know over time so it was kind of like down and flat and down and flat and Mm -hmm. some of these ufo researchers were saying well you know you can see because it's flat that's obviously got to be made by an intelligent creature and that wouldn't have just been through erosion which i think it could have been but i do think that the there are ufos if they would be going anywhere, why wouldn't they go to the place where there's the least amount of people and the most amount of water and, and stuff to get around if they were going to come to Earth? 
like they want to be around water? Well, yeah, because they could go down in the water and not be seen. Oh, so you're saying if they did have an underwater base, they might do it out there. And they wouldn't even have to have a base. I think in with the other un- unidentified aerial phenomena, they were just d- like landing on down underwater, probably to talk to their octopus friends who were also aliens, <laughs> which is a or separate theory. Or to talk to the uh, dragon serpent that lives under Well, there. it lives in a lake, not the ocean. <laughs> Maybe they're all maybe they're all friends. There's a whole wormhole. But I do think there probably are a lot of UFO sightings up there because again, if there was going to be or to your theory, if it was military testing, that's a great place to test it because there's fewer people mm-hmm. and tons of open airspace. That's true. Cause yeah, we, oh, I guess we gotta go to Alaska. The only to, way <laughs> to find this out. We need to... first hand knowledge. Mm-hmm. I don't know if uh, a cruise excursion would tell us what we need to know. We might have to just boots on the ground. Move up there. Boots on the ground. I have a friend from high school that that lives up there, oh, wow. and the pictures he posts are amazing. I had a colleague that was working up there that just said, "Yeah, there are some places that just aren't highway, so you can't go everywhere." And I thought that is, you know what? That's dedication that you're living there. Good for you. You mean if you live out in a small yeah, town? Yeah, like small areas where there's no highway. Yeah, there's it's hard to get to. There's areas with very little cell phone reception or not at all, and and things like that. So he was, yeah, yeah. and that's what what attracts a lot of people is they want to be off the grid and kind of, you know, live um, a more isolated life. So mm-hmm. what a gorgeous place to do it if that's what you're wanting to do. You think you're going to be isolated, and then the aliens come. <laughs> Well, the, but then you're not isolated anymore because then now you got to deal with the aliens. Saying, the aliens so come, you're, you're like, like shit, I moved up here to not be around people. Damn it. Now I'm on this spacecraft with all these guys. <laughs> so there's a fucking party and I did not want to come to the party. <laughs> Leave me in the cabin. They're like, we can show you yeah. the universe. I don't want the fucking universe. I want my cabin. Yeah, man, that would suck. <laughs> that would suck. If you're just like an introvert and you, you're like, of all the people for the, for, to really? get abducted. <laughs> Why? Yeah, really? Me. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess we'll have to visit Alaska. If you're from there and you know what's going on, let us, let us know. Yeah. You know, uh, it is, I'm I'm fascinated by missing person stories mm-hmm. because it's just, I like puzzles and things and my brain just works in overdrive of like what could happen and, and trying to figure it out. So these things are always interesting to think about, even if there is maybe a logical explanation that to me, honestly, of all of these, the things that could be going on, mm-hmm. Mother Nature is the scariest of all. And the most, in my opinion. Yeah, the most powerful. Yeah, because that to me, none of us can can fight. Mm-mm. It'll get like, you. Yeah, I mean, an alien or something, or I don't know. To me, that seems like... I could reason with it a bit more. We could find an alien. Maybe... I've seen Independence Day. <laughs> exactly. But Mother Nature, like, just being lost and, and feeling so small in a vast, unexplored land like that, that, to me, sends, like, shivers down my spine. They, I was just reading earlier today. It was funny because I was thinking about this movie the other day, Into the Wild, and then I read something earlier about they had to remove that bus from where it was in Alaska because so many people tried to go find it and then would die trying to find it. That's sad. Yeah, because they wouldn't know what they were getting themselves into. It's just like, you don't, the mother nature, like you can't, you can't fight it. No, and I think we are humans are guilty of hubris and and thinking that Mm -hmm. we can conquer, you know, I am the almighty man. I can conquer anything. And uh, it's like that time I drank a bunch of sangria and tried to swim across Cedar Creek Lake. Boy, made it to one side, but the getting back was rough. Did you, yeah, you you didn't have to get carried on a floaty, I a boat? I drank all the sangria out of the plastic Big Gulp cup I had and used it as a sort of floaty to manage to kick my way back. Because, you know, I can't swim, swim. I can only doggy paddle, really. And so I was having to, and I can't hold my nose underwater. So, or like, how how far of a swim was this? Oh man, well, so Cedar Creek Lakes kind of got fingers out on it, so it wasn't the big part. It was across kind of one of the finger offshoots. So I don't know, probably a football field. Dang, yeah, that's a long way to die. That's a long way to swim. Period. Yeah, well, I drank a lot of sangria, so it was a terrible idea. And then you thought I'm just going to swim. I was across like, this? I could do it. I could, I could do it. I could swim across Cedar Creek Lake. Luckily. 
a uh, woman who I, I had gone to law school with was much fitter than I was like, I'll go with you. And that was good. It was good. To have a, she helped you well, out. She could have told my story. <laughs> <laughs> For not knowing how to swim, deciding to swim across a lake is a bold move. What did I tell you? The hubris of man. I think that we've just answered what happens in the Alaska Triangle is you're just, mm-hmm. you get all juiced up on that white sangria and go, I can do it. I can take it. I can take it. <laughs> I can do it. Yep. We figured it out. But we still are going to go on vacation oh, there because sure. I just want to. Absolutely. Okay. We love providing Sinister to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including our Am I the Asshole, relationship segments, Judge Christie, and a new segment we have coming for you, which is True Crime Headlines. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll be hopping on occasionally and hosting monthly Q&As with Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. And see various body parts. (laughs) (laughs) For our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual membership tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where can we find you? I'm on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I'm on Instagram at Heather versus the world and on Twitter at MCK versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Jessica Miles. Amanda I. Guido. Dahlia Modra. Kelsey Enos. Casey Strum. Lindsay Lasseri. Amy Denise Despins, Diana Helgeson, Shauna Harvey, Amira, Chelsea Seymour, Chi Borg, Angelica Frost, Carly Garza, Renee Franks, Carrie Madkins, Hannah Bracamonte, Karen Decker, Danielle Parker, Carly M. Roosh, Stacy Barr. Thank you, Stacy. Love you. Christina Hart, Shay, Vita P., Hannah Lasley. Bridget Kerrigan, Erica Heath, Kathleen Harrison, Taylor Schrader, Rachel Poet, Teresa Caton, Catherine Carmichael, Samantha Stocken, Brianna, Katie Rogers, Samantha De Christopher, Angela Rowe, Yelly G, Mackenzie Mack, Rebecca O'Grady, Mandy Mosier, Marcia, Cassandra Kennedy, Jessica Marquis, Catherine Young. Natasha Mehta, Fanny Thompson, Jennifer Groves, Kinsey, Sophia Goldberg, Kelsey, and Kiana Davis. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We sincerely appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> Sinister Hood.